70% of us don't know how to sleep. Seven out of every 10 of you, according to the National Institutes of Health, don't sleep right. 70%. And you may be wondering what you're doing wrong. You might not have nightmares or insomnia or sleepwalking habits or even weird sleeping positions. Granted, one or more of those may apply, but it isn't these obvious reasons we should be looking out for. Rather, a much more subtle one. Social jet lag. Social jet lag refers to the disorienting changes in sleep times between days where we have obligations, like school or work, versus days where we don't have these obligations. This pattern is much more detrimental to our day-to-day -day lives than we realize, and its larger impact goes unnoticed most of the time. Not only are the effects lurking in our physical and mental well-being, but for college students like me, and many of you, it stands as a barrier to our academics, extracurriculars, and our career progress. Imagine, you find yourself as a student or employee. You're getting to work on time, you're setting your alarms up in the morning, you're setting your sleep schedule up for success that week. All of a sudden, the weekend rolls around and you have less time constraints, you have more late night commitments, and you have more reasons to sleep in the next day. That next week, social jet lag hits you like a train. For those of us that have this unbalanced sleep schedule, we try to make up for it by dozing off an extra few hours in the day or maybe even indulging in the complete opposite, staying up late to catch up on that episode that we missed out on during work or starting that FaceTime call just out of boredom. What we don't realize is that this revenge bedtime procrastination throws off our biological clock, something we call circadian misalignment. Even though our body has its own preferences of when to sleep, we push past this optimum sweet spot, especially when we want to get up to get paid. I first came across this concept with my research team, the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study here at VCU, and we study the cognitive processes of young adults. With a combination of Fitbit data, MRI readings, games, surveys, and biological samples, we're able to track their neurological development. And although slapping a Fitbit on the wrists of our participants can tell us a lot about their sleep quality, what's most jarring to me are their responses to our survey questions about sleep and wake up times. This is what a normal conversation looks like. What time do you go to bed on days where you have school? Oh, I go to bed at like 10 p.m. and I wake up at 6 a.m. the next day. All right, what about days where you don't have school, like on the weekends? I go to bed at like 5 a.m. and I wake up at 2 p.m. the next day. Their answers always catch me so off guard, especially when they're younger. As shocked as I am though, let's be real, I probably went to bed at 3 a.m. the night before work anyway, but I am right up there with you in the 70% of people that social jet lag disorients. And when I say we're in the same boat, I mean I'm probably the captain. As someone who's also a volunteer EMT, going from a whole day of classes to a night shift to a whole day of work definitely isn't the best for my social jet lag, which is still a hurdle that I'm stumbling over, but progressively getting better at conquering. Honestly, looking back at my sleep schedule in high school makes me wish I heard about these effects at an earlier age. And for a lot of these kids, they're so displaced from their internal clocks that they're basically nocturnal all the more difficult to get back to their normal schedules on Monday again, shifting from night-loving night raccoons back to humans again. So sure, we've heard a billion times to get our eight hours in, but let's say we do hit this goal and we get those eight hours, just on different times on different days throughout the week. Does it cancel out our staggered sleep? Our social jet lag accumulates throughout the week the more that we lose sleep. We can think of this as sleep debt. In order to pay it off, we shift things around even though it doesn't match our internal preferences. These inconsistencies in our sleep schedule are what interferes with our inner programming and elicits a laundry list of complications we won't be looking forward to in the future. So although social jet lag is drastically detrimental in adolescence, just like in our study, it's just as detrimental in other age groups as well. After all, you could very well be a part of that 70%. Tacking on excess amounts of social jet lag comes with what you expect with normal social jet lag and less of sleep in general. So 
poor sleep quality, finding it harder to wake up in the mornings, feeling yourself more fatigued throughout the day, you might not be as responsive in your environment and surroundings, and just underperformance in academic and workplace settings in general. Along with these acute weekly consequences of social jet lag, we also have chronic factors to consider as well. So for those of us that have a social jet lag of around two or more hours a night, we have an increased vulnerability to things like depressive symptoms or increased fat intake in our diet or even higher insulin resistance, which respectively corresponds to major depressive disorder or metabolic issues or even diabetes, among other comorbidities like obesity and adverse cardiac output. So am I telling you that losing that two hours of sleep is going to automatically give you disease? Thankfully, not exactly, or I definitely would not be standing here in front of you guys today. But it does give us implications of what we should look out for when considering our health. So on to the billion dollar question. Can we prevent this? By starting to implement lifestyle changes in students and employees, especially young adults ages 15 through 20, we can minimize the negative effects of social jet lag in our day-to-day -day lives. There's no pill, no automatic switch to fix it externally, but it rather requires an internal shift. Anyone is capable of turning the tides to apply these new techniques to our everyday lives in order to maximize our health and productive efficiency. Each individual, each of you, have your own preferences that work in your own favor, and they can be varying greatly depending on who you are and compared to the person sitting next to you. Me, for example, when I get home from a long night shift at 6 a.m., I find that sleeping in until 9 a.m. gets me back on track for the next night instead of taking random naps throughout the day. Sticking to my schedule by meal prepping for the week or engaging in my chores can get me back on course. And for each of you, that might be a different activity that benefits you. But exploring what works for you will ultimately be worth the dedication. Everyone is capable of curating an improved schedule that benefits them personally and professionally. The goals of restructuring your lifestyle and prioritizing sleep and mental health continue to stay relevant. And there are a couple ways we can incorporate this generally into our day-to-day -day routines. To start off, we must make every effort to find out what resets our circadian rhythm back to baseline again. Minimizing artificial light is a giant step in the right direction in order to preserve our natural rhythms in our sleep systems. We can even use this artificial light to our advantage by tricking our bodies in the morning to wake us up. Instead of dwelling on that blue light at night, I like to place my phone screen down, listen to music before I go to bed, and in the morning I wake up, use that artificial light to my advantage in order to look at my schedule and plan out my day. Sticking to the same routine before bedtime and in the morning can also help regulate our melatonin and cortisol levels, which are both hormones that are highly correlated with the management of our sleep cycles. There are two other very prominent factors in our sleep determination diet and exercise. And I know, I know, we've heard this a billion times, but keeping consistent, healthy diets and engaging in exercise can give us a better shot at alleviating those varying sleep patterns throughout the week. So am I telling you to throw away everything in your fridge? Absolutely not. But eating carbohydrates closer to our onset of melatonin, essentially our bedtime, can actually increase social jet lag which is a great excuse to eat dessert before dinner. Overall, fitting in earlier dinners can be much more impactful to getting a restful sleep. Exercising also keeps us functioning right, so shorter workouts in the mornings can give us a boost of energy, where longer workouts towards the end of the day can help tire us out, and we can use this to our advantage. It's as easy as walking to work, or speed walking in my case when I'm late, but our brains aren't unique. Other organs in our bodies, like our livers and our kidneys, have their own internal clocks. And we don't have to run a marathon to keep the gears running. But it does help to stay active day by day to keep the cogs in place. By harnessing this energy with our short workouts in the week and focusing extensive physical activity on the weekends, 
the urge to stay awake far into the night becomes less and less prominent. Lastly, I want to talk about the idea of activity distribution between days where we have work and our free days. By compiling our recreational activities that amount to our normal workday, we can structure our free days to mirror these workdays, giving us a better shot at satisfying our biological clocks. This also fares for a much more promising method to shrinking our sleep debt. Take remote workers, for example. In a quarantine world, they found creative techniques in order to use scheduling changes to their advantage in order to better fit in their passions. By repeating these reflective, creative, productive activities through the week, we can stick to our careers while fitting in our personal schedules. Whether it's organizing my assignments before bed, or sketching before I go to sleep, or just taking a warm shower to melt away the stress of the day, everybody is able and capable of finding their comfort activities in order to reset their day and propel their week forward. These changes don't have to be gradual, and they can be implemented today in anybody's life. It's our responsibility to listen to our circadian rhythms, to be flexible and adaptable while nurturing a healthy lifestyle. Whether you're an early bird or a night owl, you are in control. Taking a small step each day can add up to making a big difference, whether it's sketching before bed or skipping out on dessert or setting your phone aside before you sleep tonight. Our golden routines start when we step out of the schedule that we're boxed into, when we start our journey to finding our true comfort zones. So today, I challenge you to listen. I challenge you to adapt, and I challenge you to flourish. I challenge you to be that 30% instead of that 70%. And I promise you, challenge accepted, you will be someone who loves knowing how to be the master of your own sleep. Thank you.